Our top story today, though. The UK and France have agreed to go further and faster on tackling illegal immigration following a meeting yesterday between the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, and the French Interior Minister. Cleverly will also be grilled by MPs later today at the Home Affairs Select Committee as a new study predicts that net migration could see the country's population reach 70 million by 2026. That's in two years' time. So in the studio with us, Talk TV's chief political commentator Peter Carwell and also political commentator Alice Denby. Good morning to you both. Morning. morning. So we've got two stories today linked. Mm. We've got how we're trying to tackle illegal migration and we've also got predicted legal migration numbers. Should we start with the illegal migration first, Peter? Um, this arrangement, this sort of working relationship we have with France, there was a lot of sort of PR bluster about it mm. yesterday to say it's working really well. Yep. In reality, is it? No, uh, is, the, is the answer. I mean, look, small boat crossings are down. The French are doing something, and a lot of people accuse them of doing absolutely nothing. But the fact is they are doing something. And in fact, they would argue that they get about 50% of the people who try to get across the channel. And when they're doing something, it's police patrols, yep. drones. Barriers sometimes. Um, there's sometimes like taxi boats that say, right, we're going to leave at a certain time. And they advertise that. They crack down on that. They try to get some of the gang masters who are behind all that. Um, I mean, it's, it's a complex problem. It's one that we have talked about. Rishi Sunak talked about stopping the boats, not reducing the boats, but stopping the boats. They're down by about 36%, and it's actually a bigger problem across Europe than it is in the UK. But, you know, James Cleverly meeting his French counterpart, it's probably just they haven't had a meeting in a while, but and it's another opportunity for them to say, look at this, it's all working beautifully and perfectly, when clearly it isn't. Alice, the way that the figures have been extrapolated seem to be, on the face of it, alarming. There are 67.8 million people in the UK now. In two years' time, we could be looking at 70 million. By 2036, we could be looking at 74 million. Do you think this is sustainable? Absolutely not. And, and to be clear, that those are figures of legal migration. These are people who are going to come here by completely legitimate routes. Um, six million people, that's, what, five cities the size of Birmingham over the next 15 years. That is going to require us to build 500,000 more houses a year. Uh, at the moment, we're managing less than half of that. So where are these people going to live? With public services under the strain that they are? I mean, that level of migration at the moment, with the country and the state that it is, is completely unsustainable. It's not just housing, is it? it, it or public services. We've got infrastructure. I mean, we've mm. got sewage problems, haven't we, in this country? And, and transport as well. The roads are full in large parts of the country as well. You just do wonder how... But then, everyone says, we need immigration to keep the economy at the level that we've got it at the moment. I think... I mean, the, I think the idea that immigration is always and in every circumstance good for growth has been very much strained over past years. I mean, growth has been completely flat while immigration has skyrocketed. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to note with your other top story uh, this week that, that uh, with Brexit, people were promised that overall numbers would come down. And the exact opposite has happened yeah. as a result of... I'm trying to think of a single Brexit promise <laughs> that has been uh, concluded properly. Well, exactly. And this was a legal migration system that was deliberately designed post-Brexit. Um, so this isn't a sort of mistake. This isn't because we can't control the levers ourselves. So, this was a deliberate choice. So, Peter, what actually is the current government policy when it comes to legal migration? Um, they, it's essentially... Well... It's hard to know exactly how many people they want to let in. We have those record figures of 745 uh, million. Certainly there are... Uh, sorry, 745,000 net. Mm. Uh, it's really interesting in terms of the government and what they want to do. They're talking about skills gaps, as Nick correctly says, but also there are many... I mean, there, there are more people who are unemployed in this country uh, on benefits who can work but don't, um, who could in theory, fill some of those gaps, perhaps in unskilled, hate the, I hate the word, but uh, unskilled um, uh, jobs like the care system, for example, where you can be trained up to do it. Um, it's interesting as well, I think, that there are many people who have uh, mental illness, physical illness, there are a lot of people who are on disability benefits. The, people, uh, the government's trying quite hard, actually, to get people back into the workforce or get them to do sort of some work. But what's interesting from an immigration perspective is that we, you know, we've opened up, essentially, immigration to uh, people on an, on, a, on an equal basis right across the world. So it's not as though there's free movement within mm. the EU coming here. That's different. But then when there's people coming here, there are lots of students coming, there are lots of people coming on work visas, and it is out of control. It is too high. There's no doubt about there it. There have been some efforts to try and control or at least reduce that number, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to students. Yes, there have. And certainly students have been told they can't bring their families. Mm. They've also been told if they can only actually come or bring any dependents if they are doing things like PhDs, very, very uh, advanced um, academic studies. So there are some attempts to, to sort this out, but the fact is that lots of people are still coming 
uh, many, many people are coming legally, of course, and this is an attractive country. Many, pe many people yeah, want to live Yeah, you can see why here. people want to come, of course. Yes, mm. yeah. Well, I think this is, in some ways, linked to the second story that we'd like to discuss this morning. Uh, the uh, idea that we should declare a health emergency, whichever party is in power after the next election, we should look at the NHS, declare a health mm. emergency, and then look at resourcing it properly. We're going to be speaking to one of the lead authors of this report later on in the programme. Uh, as I said earlier, health emergency is a very emotive phrase, but there is obviously a clear feeling that something needs to be done about the NHS, which at the moment is reliant on foreign workers to keep it ticking over, and it doesn't seem to be doing that well. Are we in a health, are we in a health crisis with the NHS, Alice? I'm not quite sure what, uh, the, what that means. We seem to have an NHS crisis every winter. This seems to be an attempt to call for uh, ever more resources for the NHS without doing the proper reform that's needed. I think in the letter, if you read it, it says we need to uh, how, we need to ensure that the, that the NHS is permanently paid for out of general taxation. We need everybody in the country to rally round and support the NHS. I mean, this sounds like they want, what, conscription for the NHS? <laughs> well, the, well, the point is as well that, I mean, you make a really good point, Alice, in that when the Conservatives came to power, their, the NHS in England and Wales was uh, given £139 billion a year. Now it's given about £180 billion a year. There's no other public service that's had that increase. Now, other countries will say they spend more per head of population on their health services, but the fact is that, from the NHS perspective, they've had a massive increase in funding. The problem is... And waiting lists have gone up. And waiting lists have gone up. We're probably going to hit 8 million fairly soon. The problem is not just money. Mm. The problem is reform. But then any time a reform is attempted, remember Andrew Lansley's reforms about 10 years ago, it's resisted and it's said that you know they won't work. There is I have a friend who worked quite in a, quite a senior position in the NHS, and my every time I saw him, I said, what's the NHS crisis mm. this week? Mm. It's like a small country. It employs over a million people. There are always going to be problems. But this report, I'd be a little bit sceptical about this report because the answer, they say, is more bureaucracy. Mm. And what the NHS needs is a heck of a lot less bureaucracy and a lot more care. One and thing that might reduce a bit of pressure off NHS, particularly GP practices, is the Pharmacy First initiative that comes in uh, to force today. We're going to be live at a pharmacy uh, just shortly. The final thing I want to get from both of you, it is the anniversary of Brexit today, four years on. Uh, Nick has been asking everyone desperately this morning, can you name us something that Brexit means Britain is better off for? Either of you. I'm, Go ahead. I'm struggling. I mean, the one that the government likes to talk about is the vaccine rollout, but frankly, I feel like we, you know, we, we were the first country to start vaccinating, but we ended up unlocking at about the same time as everyone else in Europe. So I feel, I feel like if there was an advantage there, we squandered it. Um, that's, a, that's a damning indictment. Go on, sorry, Peter. <laughs> I'm trying to think. It's interesting, actually, from Northern Ireland's perspective. Of course, they're, they'll have the legislation published today. Measurably worse, would you well, say, in Northern apparently Ireland? apparently there are going to be zero checks. I mean, I'm not sure I believe Geoffrey Donaldson when he says there are going to be zero checks on all the goods coming. For Northern Ireland, it, is, it, is, it does have access to the European single market, but also the, U, the UK market. So um, from, a, from a, their perspective, they're doing quite well. But then, of course, they had that before Brexit anyway. But, yeah, four years today, where does the time go? Time goes when you're... Time flies when you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> cast off the shackles just, of our Brussels Just very quickly, Brussels oppressors. in a word then, before we move on, given that no-one seems to be able to name a single concrete Brexit benefit, do you see us rejoining the EU in our lifetimes? No. Not no, I, I think... I think it's, it's a whole other debate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it opened up that big can. 